Swinburne University of Technology. Morning all, Craig again. We're uh, doing, what are we doing? We're doing the sociology of education today, which is topic seven, um, carrying on the theme. Mm -hmm. um, well, just at the moment, um, well, okay, it's about, <laughs> it's about seven weeks on from when it happened, but there was a report handed down to the federal, the Australian federal government called the Gonks Gonkski report, which is a report on the state of education in Australia. And if you followed that debate to, to any extent, even, even the news reports, you'd get an idea of, well, if you didn't realise already, I suppose, how important education is, duh. Um, <laughs> All right, I'm really good at the bleeding obvious sometimes. Um, but one of the key uh, debates within uh, or the surrounding context of, of the, uh, the report and the toing and froing between the government and the opposition um, re resolve, revolves around the, the socioeconomic status of institutions uh, um, and, and generally the divide is, is uh, a binary, binary one between public and private and it's made binary by the, the people who are arguing for their p specific constituencies, um, rich and elite private schools and poor struggling state schools. Of course between those two polarities there's a myriad of, of differences that are expressed in um, in quite good public school, well no, very good state schools, public schools run by, by the government that achieve very high results, uh, struggling independent schools, particularly struggling Catholic schools uh, and all of those sort of in between areas in, in and on both sides of the debate, but the interesting thing is the socio-economic, the socio-economic debate, and it was um, the education debate was riven um, b with that sort of ideological, what the Liberal Party like to call the politics of envy, um, in the um, in the late nineties into the two thousands under the Howard government, where they changed how they funded. Um, private schools and, and what they essentially did was they funded private schools on their postcode um, and so that was they, they assessed the socio-economic st uh, status of the surrounding area um, and, and the funding was allowed to go to them on that basis which mm, um, if you think of uh, a school like in Sydney, a King's School, which is out in the western suburbs, despite the fact that Parramatta is probably um, maybe a lot more salubrious uh, than it was when my great-grandmother was born there, or my grandmother as well, um, still it's, 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 it's set in the western suburbs. So too with Geelong Grammar in, in Victoria, which is one of the, the very elite private schools, the one where Prince Charles went to when uh, he was a lad and he still had, oh no, he's still got hair, hasn't he, David? He's still got hair, no, it just hasn't got that bit there. Um, um, Geelong is, is uh, particularly at the moment, uh, it seems a, a struggling area. So that allowed, that allowed the government to, to open up funding to, to private schools. So we had the, um, we had the issue in, um, at, a, at a federal government level where private schools, well, where, yeah, where private schools were getting 70% around, 70% of federal government funding and state schools were getting 30% of the funding. Um, now, the primary funder of schools in Australia are uh, state governments. So, and in, in the, uh, the case of the state government, 70% of their money was going to the public schools and 30, roughly 30% 30 to, to the private schools. But there was argument and discussion that the, the Howard government was trying to, to push funds to the, the private schools to, I don't know, to um, as a response to, to their constituency, but more in a more broader sense. And again, this is where we're talking about the, 
where I'm talking about and using the sociological imagination to tease it out, you're also looking at a, a broader context of uh, economic and, and social reform and one of the things you would argue about that move was that it was responding to the, the, the new sort of right-wing neoliberal um, market economic attitude towards the individual's right to receive government from, from the money from the government um, because I'm, I'm, I'm going to sound a bit like a socialist now because they are taxpayers and citizens. It hadn't always been the case. Oh, sorry, okay, I'll stop there. My explanation for that is, is what I've just said is that one of the ways that it was argued that the welfare state should work is everybody in, uh, in the country, every citizen should have the benefits of the welfare state. Um, and that made that made it a universal system and, and in a sense it made it harder more difficult for people to argue against uh, different groups getting it when it was available to everybody the shift that's happened that's 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 made that that a little different is is that welfare state attitude has been taken over to sort of the taxation system and and so that that obviously we all pay taxation but but the argument has run under this new form of economic organization called neoliberalism that if you're paying tax you should then have the right to yield the benefit of those those taxes in all areas so that the argument for education is that if I'm wealthy and I've decided to send my, my kid to, to a flash private school and pay uh, $30,000 a year for that privilege to, to go to a school with enormous uh, amounts of resources, uh, a, uh, a, a core group of students who to a certain extent have been hand-picked in the sense that the students who they don't think are going to work out for them do get hived off. Um, in, the, in the welfare state days, it was assumed that, that you've opted out of the state system and you've chosen to pay your way in the private system. That was a choice because there was a perfectly good public system set up for students. Uh, and if you opted out of that, then you opted out of it. The discourse now has shifted um, because the rights of the individual under neoliberalism have become more paramount and it's not so much about the collective anymore, it's about the individual rights. If I'm paying tax, I'm choosing to send my, my kid to, to the flash school, then the proportion of my tax... Sorry, fine. The proportion of my tax... I get a bit pervy because the number comes up so I can see who's ringing. Um, nobody will be more important than you guys though, so I'm staying here. Um, the proportion of my tax that I would see that is going to education, if, if you think of, of the tax you pay every year as being divided up over the, the various government departments that get funded, you go, well, if I'm paying $100 tax, at least one of those dollars out of that hundred is going towards education. I want my dollar value back. I'm, I have rights as a taxpayer and so I want it back. So that argument has really got hold of the, um, the population and governments, both of both persuasions, so that now funding is, is flowing to private schools and to private schools you would, you would suggest that don't need that sort of funding, but they've they've been reasonably clever and manipulative in the way that they've dealt with this thing. So um, they've, like I was referring to earlier, this this notion of the politics of envy um, then gets gets used to slap down arguments that that resources that that are going to to schools with swimming pools and you know lots of football fields and reception areas and all of that sort of stuff really should go to to the poor school so the education debate um, is at one time about um, about literacy and and the content of the course um, but also um, also about the, the the politics surrounding it because education is funded by by government um, uh, then it's hard to avoid the politics of that and the politics of that have, have as I was saying at the beginning have, have been been quite redolent in, in, in the context of this report that's been released. So understanding education um, and understanding the sociology of education 
um, means understanding uh, understanding politics and and the political machinations that that go on about um, political parties, governments or oppositions, say in the case of Australia, understanding their politics, understanding their constituency uh, and understanding their ideology uh, to, to a great extent actually. So it's, it's, it's hard to separate out um, uh, these sort of areas from, from the political because um, they're funded by governments, and if we look at the the sort of the macro situation, which there's more about in the lectures, I say pointing back to the to the um, to the blackboard site where you'll be you'll be reading this stuff. Um, when when you're looking at the macro, the the, the world situation, it's still um, riven by politics, um, but uh, on a much a much grander scale, and and involves the United Nations and, and uh, non-government organisations uh, assisting to, to deliver education to, to people who, who don't have or who haven't had access to it. So um, it's simply not about, about content, although um, you'll, if, if you followed education, the shifts in education, you'll, you'll know that, that there has been, there's been sort of arguments about literacy, uh, levels of literacy in, a, in Australia, um, there's arguments about how they should be delivered, there's arguments about, there's always arguments about teachers, there's um, also partly um, uh, one, of, one of the, the, there have been a few shifts, okay, I should pull back. There have been a few shifts in education in Australia and, and if we look at it sociologically um, we're, we're looking at, at um, attitudes about um, corporatisation I suppose. One of the, the, the best ways to understand the shift in, in the, the institutional world, the structural world that, that I've been banging on about quite a bit in the, the last few lectures is that, that we've become influenced by um, man what what used to be called managerialism that we've called cor corporatization where all institutions um, apart from sort of private private businesses but institutions of government uh, universities um, all levels three levels of government non-government organizations even charities have become influenced by the this this shift to neoliberalism that I've been talked about that says to these organisations that they should be run like businesses, like corporations. That's what I mean by corporatisation. So that the principles that run run a business, and remember that business run for excuse me for profit, and their motive is to make a profit. And remember one of the the quickest way to increase your profit, and again this has been happening over the last few weeks, you'll have to think back about seven weeks now, um, is that uh, sacking people is a very quick way to, to increase your profits because you're, you're cutting your costs. This started in the 80s and, and seems to be happening with a bit of a flourish now. So. In terms of education, we're looking at the corporatization of education, and that's manifested in a few ways. One of one of the ways is that there's there's an argument now that that uh, even in state schools, uh, because this is the case in private schools, the headmaster should be like the CEO. Uh, the headmaster should be the boss of the school. The headmaster should have the right to hire and fire uh, staff whenever they like. No tenure, um, no ongoing right to to have a job that if you're not performing you get you get the sack um, and partly okay so this is influenced by that corporate corporate model it's also influenced by by the need to to increase the the school's results so that, that their results uh, look better and if you think of results sort of as as the equivalent of profit um, you have this this imp impetus and and urgency to to increase profit or in this case increase the 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 standard of results and sometimes you have to think that it's not 
necessarily for the benefit of the kids but for the benefit of the institution and for this sort of more, much more competitive world that's come into education so um, how many a few years ago you know, some years ago uh, my daughter wanted to leave a Steiner school which is sort of an alternative form of education and go to a normal high school she got sick of being a hippie and I don't want to be a hippie anymore okay that's fine and she wanted to be pushed which was really remarkable um, so we went around looking for schools for her and 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 really it was it was it was much like shopping we went to to various schools around the area they had they had glossy brochures big packs to give us we were had a, we were taken on tours we were given we were sort of given a sales pitch by uh, these reasonably ordinary state schools in the um, the eastern suburbs of Melbourne. It was it was a, a bit of an eye opener for me, although I understood that this was going on. I hadn't had the experience, so we've had this corporatisation uh, of education going on. And so remember that the background to this is the shift in the economic organisation, the form of capitalism we have. Again, this is sort of teasing out the 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 sociological imagination. The other, the other big thing we've had, and we have it here at universities as well, is the increased um, vocationalisation of education. Education has become much more about targeting skills, um, uh, bringing skills to, to students and skills that they can demonstrate to employers that they have so that they are instantly employable. The process of education is, is becoming much more about the process of uh, skilling students rather than than giving students the the sort of critical analytical skills that that you would you, that we think we argue in 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 sociology is, is important for engaged effective uh, interesting um, and successful employees if you like it it seems now that that again under this this notion of corporatization um, business has, has, has captured to a certain extent uh, both secondary and tertiary education to produce workers for them who they don't have to invest in to the same extent that they, or they'll argue that they, they still do, but, but they want to take, take a student, particularly from university who has a degree like these things up on the wall here and the, the name on the degree um, is actually a job description rather than a description of the the form of education that you've had. So th it's important to keep keep those those contextualising uh, circumstances, political circumstances, in mind because um, I think the politics of, of education um, is is a key thing in in understanding how it works. And this is this is part of understanding the sociology of education. But if we if we take this out to a macro level, which which we're um, looking at in in the um, in the lectures, um, one of the one of the the key points in the lectures. Um, talks about literacy and, and literacy, the ability to read and write, um, um, probably hand in hand with, with uh, numeracy, which is the, uh, the ability to be able to deal with, with figures in a sort of uh, an arithmetic way. Um, mathematics would come much later, but be able to, to manipulate simple figures, be, be able to, and let me, I'll, I'll read it exactly, UNESCO, the United Nations um, organization um, is said to be the, its measurement of, of a literate person is somebody who can write a short autobiographic statement of their life and read it back to those who are asking. So it's simply getting giving people an A4 sheet, give me a quick synopsis of your life, you know, go to now and um, then read it back to me. There are seven to eight hundred million people in the world who can't do that. Seven or eight hundred million people in the world. And it may be no surprise to guess that, that most of those are women um, and then to a lesser extent children. So that um, illiteracy is still a major problem and that's been one of the, the broader focuses of those um, non-government organisations like the United Nations who are, are trying to focus on that but 
complicating that as well is the need for an, an, a new literacy. So not only do we have to, to get these people literate in terms of being able to conceptualise, write and then read back, we then have to move them to this digital literacy. You know, they need to be able to manipulate one of these things or one of these things or one of these things, you know. It's a bit much, isn't it, really? <laughs> um, and without digital literacy, the, the sort of literacy that, that, that I was referring to that they're, they're struggling with is going to have a limited opportunity for expression as well. So being, if, if you can't write and you can't manipulate one of these things, you're going to be, be trapped in, in, in a dangerous state. Now, um, the, there are a number of... Um, um, the role of education um, in from a sociological point of view, we, we see in a number of ways, and this, this harks back to what I was talking about earlier in, in relation to, to, um, to so Durkheim and, and Marx in, in particular. Um, the functionalist view, which is Durkheim, says that education is, about to re is, is there to reinforce the surrounding social values and, and then to, to add a sort of an ethical and some may suggest a moral in terms of religious education because religious education would, would, would say that they, they, they have a moral component to, to part of their education curriculum as well. Um, so you've got this, this functionalist thing that says, well, education is there to, to create good citizens in the context of the society in which they live. Um, and that's, that makes sense and that's not, that's, that's not unreasonable and to, to a certain extent that is, is the case, that the, the education system is, is there to, to support the surrounding nor, norms and values as we've been talking about over the past few lectures or few weeks. But the problem with that is that it's not challenging, it's not, it's not pushing, pushing the boundaries um, um, and creating citizens who are going to challenge and be, be more engaged and, and less accepting of, of status quos. Status quos? Yeah, yeah, we're agreeing, status quos. Um, it's probably not. Right in, email me, ring me up, tell me what the plural status quo is. Um, and there are things that need to change. There are always things that need to, to, to change in society. And if you've got an education system that's just reinforcing the, the surrounding social values, um, and you know, without picking out particular politicians, notions of white picket fences and mum, dad and three kids, um, the old hippie 60s thing of consume, be silent, die, is, it, it sort of captures that, that, that functionalist notion. Um, it's not to say that, that that shouldn't be a baseline, but we need to build on that and, um, and create critical, um, and gain critical in that positive sense that I've been talking about, critically engaged students who are, are going to, to challenge and, and push boundaries uh, in order to to sort of move society on socially and sort of intellectually and scientifically and and sort of maybe morally, we've um, we've just had this um, last night. The um, the Australian Prime Minister met with three gay couples for dinner at the lodge to talk about talk about gay marriage. Um, so. Um, how long ago? Twenty years ago, David. Ten years ago, that wouldn't have happened. Mr. Howard wouldn't have been, in, no, 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 Mr. Howard wouldn't have been inviting gay couples. But by the same token, um, Hawkey mightn't have either. No, Kitty May, he's not sure. Yeah, maybe, 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 maybe. So um, this sort of, of, if you like, moral component, um, uh, social component to education is an important one too. And if you don't, 
have that in in the education system and not necessarily I'm not saying that that you need to have gay marriage as a part of the curriculum but what you have to what what then conflict theory in terms of from a sociological point of view conflict theory will argue that you need these challenging aspects in the education system now as I was just about to say you don't necessarily have to have a curriculum on gay marriage in in the education system but you you conflict theory will argue that you need to educate people to confront issues and to to look for areas where uh, there could be social advances made that are being held back by powerful or interested groups who don't want the status quo to change simply by conservative groups who by the the nature of the the, the definition of, of conservative, they want to retain um, what the status quo is and not move outside that because it's, it's safe, it's comfortable and it's also controllable. So uh, what conflict theory says is that, that an education curriculum needs to contain elements that encourage students who will be voting citizens eventually and in the context of you and me um, we're all voting citizens and what we want uh, are, again critically engaged citizens who understand that, that, that maintaining the status quo isn't necessarily the answer to, to social, business, scientific, ethical or moral issues. Pushing those appropriately um, when society's ready for those changes is important. If, if we didn't have that critical or conflict, what we call conflict theory approach, and conflict theory is Marx, Marx is a conflict theory, feminism is a conflict theory as well. Um, if we didn't have those sort of conflictual elements um, from a theoretical point of view embedded in the education system or the, the sort of the broader social discourse, feminism wouldn't have flourished as it did. W women's position wouldn't have improved to the, the extent that it has. Um, so we need, we, we need from, from a conflict theory point of view, those sort of elements in, in our education system in order for, for the society to, to, to be progressive. Now, like I said, there, there, there are conservative elements who aren't interested in that, who are, who would say, well, let's not w worry about all that sort of bullshit, that's, that's that, that radical stirry stuff um, died off in the 60s. What we want now, what's much more important is to get, get a kid a job and maybe people, people like you, a job or a better job and we'll worry about that later. That's maybe uh, the icing on, on the educational cake, if you like, that fitting fitting students with skills that are going to get them jobs to make the, the distance from education to a job as short as possible um, and as smooth as possible without bumps and lumps upon, along the way while you're trying to get, get the articulation between knowledge and skills brought together is the important thing. Uh, I'm not making necessarily making an argument for either. You can read what you like into how I represent it. but. These are the these are sort of the two polarities that we're we're dealing with at at the moment in education, and it's certainly the instrumental and the 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 vocational the, that's that's winning at the moment. Um, and then in the broader context that that I've been talking about in the um, in the the written lectures and that you'll find in the textbook is is dealing with with the association between poverty and illiteracy and, and making sure that, that, that we lift everybody up in, in, in times really despite the, the global financial crisis when we should be able to afford to do that. So look, that's broadly the, the, the context of, of education both sort of locally and internationally. Um, have a read of the book and I'll see you next week with I don't know what the next lecture is. I'll go and have a look. I'll see you later. This has been a Swinburne production.